Good evening, everyone. And welcome for those of you who are back for the first time in person. Welcome back. Welcome back. We're so happy you're here. I'm Dr. Michelle Farmer. I'm the chair of the boards here of the Enoch Pratt Free Library, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you. Thank you for coming. This is a very special event of the Brown Lecture Series featuring our honored speaker, Mr. Eric Holder. Now, I'm... I'm going to be giving a little more details in terms of uh, a formal introduction uh, of Mr. Holder, but first I want to make a few comments. I want to thank the Eddie C. and C. Sylvia Brown Foundation for their generous, generous... <clears throat> the Brown Foundation has been generous in consistently providing uh, the funding for the Brown Lecture Series, which allows us to continue to offer this series free to the public. And it's our pleasure, and we really want to thank them. Um, this is part of the Pratt's Black History Month celebration. There are a number of other events and activities to tell you about. Um, one is, um, if you have a chance, in the annex over here is a beautiful exhibit of the life and legacy of Harriet Tubman. But that's not all. In Writers Live programs, we're gonna have two featured speakers. On February 16th, Kristen Henning will be presenting her book, The Rage of Innocence. And on February 22nd, Alora Young will take the stage and talk about her book, Walking Gentry Home. And um, looking ahead to the future, we will have the great imagination celebration for families if you bring your cousins, your uncles, your little kids, grandkids, March 25th, we're gonna have a special family celebration. Hope you come back for that. All right, um, we also let you know that um, the compass is, I think, right out the, by the door. It's also available online. It lists all of these activities and more. So now for tonight's big event. Allow me to introduce Eric Holder, who was our former Attorney General under President Barack Obama's, Obama's administration. And no surprise, he is the first African-American to hold the role of Attorney General of the United States of America. He will be talking with us tonight about his book, Our Unfinished March, and he's going to be in conversation with University of Baltimore's president, Kurt Schmoke. I'm sure, I'm sure all y'all know and recognize uh, President Kurt Schmoke as our former mayor, but <laughs> and he's also a member of the board of the Enoch Pratt Free Library. <laughs> <laughs> Just as a personal aside, I have to say the University of Baltimore President Schmoke consistently gives back to the city of Baltimore and we are grateful. Thank you. Thank you. So, without any further comments, I just want to welcome uh, President, University of Baltimore President Kurt Schmoke and Mr. Eric Holder, our, our, our former, former Attorney General, uh, to start their conversation. And thank you all once again. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. Ladies and gentlemen, it's really a pleasure to, to see you. I, you know, looking at this audience, it makes me feel like I should run again. I, uh... <laughs> yeah. Let's go. Yeah. It starts right here, right now. <laughs> Goodness. Except my wife didn't applaud. I don't know. <laughs> You know, it, it is wonderful that you're here, General. I mean, you are the 82nd 
attorney general in the United States, but the first African American yeah. attorney general. So we are so eighty one proud- before me looked a little different. <laughs> a, little bit, a little bit different. I uh, thank you very much. We're, we're going to spend time on uh, your book, uh, our unfinished march. Uh, subtitled The Violent Past and Imperiled Future of the Vote, the History, a Crisis, a Plan. And uh, I know that you start the book talking about a march that we are familiar with because of John Lewis, the, the, Sel- the march from uh, Selma. Uh, but, but you focus on one of the unsung heroes. And I thought we could start with you talking a little bit to the audience about a man named Jimmy Lee Jackson. Sure, sure. Well, first off, thank you all so much for coming out, and it is great to be in Baltimore. It's uh, good to see that our country and this city, we're getting back. It's like, look, huge numbers of people. This is good. I like this, you know, with masks on. That's good. Um, Jimmy, Jimmy Lee Jackson, uh, un, unsung hero. I, I think that's a fair um, depiction of him. Uh, he had a grandfather, Cager Lee, who wanted to register uh, to vote. Took him down there to register to vote. Um, in Alabama, did not have the ability to do so, saw the disappointment um, on his uh, grandfather's face and determined that he wanted to become an activist um, and and do things to make sure that people had uh, the right to vote. Uh, He ultimately is killed in a a protest um, by the authorities in in, in Selma, uh, dies trying to protect um, Cager Lee, his, his grandfather, protects him, he's ultimately shot. Uh, Dr. King comes and preaches at his, um, at, his, at, his, at his funeral, his funeral services. He had become a recognized, um, re- recognized activist and a determination is made. Well, how do we dramatize what has happened um, to, to Jimmy Lee Jackson? What do we do to honor his memory? And that's where the notion of a march from Selma to Montgomery actually comes about. I mean, there's so many parts of the civil rights movement that are connected to the right to vote that people don't necessarily understand or remember. You know, the, the march from Selma to, Montgomery, Selma to Montgomery, the death of those three civil rights workers in Mississippi in 1964, Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman, they were there in the so-called Freedom Summer to register people um, to vote. Getting the right to vote for African Americans in the South was a central part of the, uh, of the civil rights movement. Wow, and from that march comes Voting Rights Act, Right. Why did it have to be reauthorized? Um, Couldn't it just been permanent law? Yeah, it certainly could have been. But um, the determination was made to pass it for a set number of years, I think, with the thought that perhaps at the conclusion of that initial set of years, the South or the covered states would be in a fundamentally different place and there would not be the need to extend it, to reauthorize it. But every time um, that period of reauthorization ended, Congress would hold hearings, uh, make determinations that in fact there was the need to reauthorize uh, what is the crown jewel of the civil rights movement, which is the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and which is still in effect, though wounded um, grievously by a a Supreme Court case in 2013 um, by the Roberts um, Supreme Court. You know, I'll get get to that, um, because the one nice thing about the book you talk about uh, history, remind us of the U.S. history. One thing you say is that uh, most of our history, we, we weren't a democracy. No, that's exactly right. I mean, people, we were not born, um, you know, in 1776 and immediately became a nation that welcomed everybody, gave everybody the opportunity to vote. In fact, the first group of people who said that, look, you know, we're, unfor- we're unfairly excluded from, from voting, the first group was white men who didn't own property. Um, When George Washington is elected in his first um, election, only 6% of the people eligible to vote, we would now say eligible to vote, actually were um, allowed to cast uh, cast a ballot. Uh, And so white men without property said, well, wait a minute, why are we prevented from voting? You know, we have to serve in the army, we have to do a whole range of other civic things, but these folks um, can, people with property. And so they successfully fought for um, the right to vote. And it was interesting, during the Constitutional Convention, the founding fathers are trying to determine, well, who should have the right to vote? And some folks said, some of the founding fathers said, well, if you give um, men without property the right to vote, they don't necessarily have the intellectual capacity, (laughs) and they will be subject to bribes, they'll be 
taken advantage of. And one of the founding fathers says, well, wait a minute. If you give white men without property the right to vote, other groups are going to demand the right to vote. And one says, well, you know what? Women could ask for the right to vote. <laughs> oh, 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 you know, imagine that horror. And um, what they were concerned about, in fact, was true. What was set in motion by that first group of people uh, galvanized other groups of people to say, you know what? I am allegedly, supposedly, an American citizen. I am paying taxes. I'm serving in the armed forces. I'm doing a whole range of other things. Why don't I have uh, the right to vote? And what they said was going to happen, in fact, did happen. Yeah. So uh, with respect to uh, women, you write about uh, another unsung heroine, uh, Alice, Alice Paul. Paul. You want to tell us about her? Yeah. Alice Paul was an activist um, who determined that women should have uh, the right to vote. And she was, what, she was a firebrand. I mean, she was dedicated, focused, was prepared um, to sacrifice. Um, in 1913, she's part of a march that um, you know, tries to get the right for, to vote for, for women, uh, a big march in, in Washington, D.C. Um, and it's an interesting thing. I, I go on Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. all the time, same place that they marched. And these women, they expected opposition, but what they actually had to face was far greater than that. They were spat upon, beaten, um, all in an attempt to make sure that women would not get the right to vote. By 1917, she is coming back, coming back, coming back, coming back, trying to get um, you know, the United States to grant suffrage um, to women. And there's a night, this so-called night of terror in 1917, where a group of women who are protesting are arrested, um, taken to the DC jail, um, beaten, and then they go on a, a hunger strike. They were then force-fed through the use of some oversized hoses put down their noses. And um, the United States, the country, is so appalled by what they hear about the treatment of these women. And President Wilson, um, also appalled by what happens, it actually moves him to come to support an amendment to the Constitution uh, supporting the right to vote. And then we talk about how uh, he had to work its way through the legislature and how um, a senator, a, a representative, I guess it was in Tennessee, um, convinced by his mother uh, to cast an appropriate vote ballot, uh, an appropriate vote actually um, made sure that the amendment was passed and women were granted the right to vote. But I think the thing that's important there is that groups who got the right to vote didn't get the right to vote because their time had come. Mm -hmm. uh, women didn't get the right to vote simply because, all right, it's time. African Americans didn't truly get the right to vote in uh, 1965 or so because it was time. It was because people like Alice Paul, people like Jimmy Lee Jackson, people like, uh, you know, Cager Lee, uh, people like Albert Turner, um, people sacrificed, committed themselves, um, put themselves at great risk to ensure that everyone would ultimately have uh, the right to vote. Positive change um, is not promised. It's only a function of great effort and great um, sacrifice. You um, just alluded to um, a man named Albert Turner, and, and the reason why I wanted you to mention him a little bit more, um, I try to tell people all the time, it, it, it does make a difference who's in office. And it makes a difference who's the attorney general of, of the United States. And I w ask you to explain who was the attorney general that dealt with Albert Turner. All right, so Albert Turner is a legendary figure in Alabama fighting for the right to vote. He actually led the procession um, of Dr. King, Dr. King's um, funeral. Um, a legendary figure and a real advocate for and activist for you know, spreading the, the franchise um, when Attorney General Sessions is the United States Attorney in Alabama, he, for whatever reason, decides he wants to prosecute um, Albert Turner for voter fraud. It's a case that ultimately, you know, falls apart. There's no, you know, there's no substance to the case. But what he did, that is what Sessions did, was so appalling that it actually prevented Sessions from getting a judgeship that he had been nominated for. Um, 
civil rights groups testified against him. People looked at what he had done with Albert Turner, and it's a rare thing, but he was not confirmed as a um, United States district judge. Now, the negative side of that is that he became a United States senator, and then he became attorney general of the United States. Charged with responsibility for the Voting Rights Act. With Exactly right. Uh, you know, if, they, if he had been confirmed, he might have served his time as a judge, I don't, who knows what damage he might have done, you know, as a judge, but he certainly, you know, as I said, became a senator and then became um, attorney general of the United States. You know, so we have this civil war in the United States, and after the civil war, we get these amendments to the Constitution, supposedly guaranteeing people, uh, all people, uh, the right to vote. But then legislators start manipulating and creating all kinds of uh, uh roadblocks, and, and you refer to some of them as legislative evil genius. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering whether you think legislative evil genius is with us today. Oh, absolutely. I don't think there's, uh, I don't think there's any question. You know, what these legislators did back uh, post-Civil War in the beginning of the 20th century was to put in place measures that seemed on their face to be neutral. You know, um, but they did so with the knowledge that um, they were going to have a negative impact on the ability of African Americans to cast a ballot. Again, they looked facially neutral, but they had a negative impact on the impact, the uh, negative impact on the uh, ability of black folks to vote. You think, for instance, you say, all right, well, convicted felons cannot vote, right? So I, I don't know if good policy, bad policy, all right, but convicted felons can't vote. All right, so that's that. You just pass that bill. All right, and then you go out and you, what do you do? You start arresting black people, you know, for a variety of crimes. You make them felons, and in that way, you don't have they don't have the ability um, to vote. You, you know, you come up with things like literacy tests, um, poll taxes, so that poor people can't um, that, that they can't pay. A whole range of things that, again, on their face, seem neutral. So now we're in the 21st century. And they come up with a whole range of other things that, again, seem to be on their face relatively neutral. Texas passes a law that says you've got to have a, a state-issued photo ID in order to vote. Okay. Um, and if you have a state-issued photo ID that says that you have the right to carry a concealed weapon, that's good. If you have a state-issued photo ID that says you're a student at the University of Texas, that's not good. So again, they're making you know determinations about who they want to uh, who they want to have vote. Oh, but on the, the Texas law, I think you once called it a poll tax. Why is an ID law? Why why do you refer to it as a poll tax? Because a lot of people, they, the, the, the assumption is everybody would be able to show their driver's license. Ah. But statistically, what you see is that people of color uh, are far less are, are less likely to have. Um, driver's licenses than, um, than, than, than white folks. And here you gotta understand, we're talking about things that are done on the margins. If you can depress turnout by four, five, six percent, you can determine an election. You can change the, the course of an election. So if you don't have um, state issued ID, if you don't have a driver's license, well then you can go to an office and you can get the necessary material so that you can get a, a state issued ID. But in Texas, you had to pay $22. Oh. in order to get the background material pulled up and looked at and examined so that you could then get your state-issued photo ID. So in other words, to vote, you had to pay that $22, and oh, I, I call see. that uh, a poll tax. Right. So uh, has the Supreme Court been real helpful to you? Uh... <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, the Supreme Court, for a long time, the federal courts were seen as the place where uh, seen as the, the place that protected the, the right to vote. That really has changed in, in recent years, um, starting, well, not starting with, but continuing with through a case called Shelby County versus Holder. Um, although if you want to like piss me off, you call it Shelby County versus Holder. It is the <laughs> Shelby County case. I don't want my name associated with that case uh, in any way. It's like, you know, You'd be like Dred Scott versus Holder. You don't, you know, you don't, you know, <laughs> you don't want your name associated with that case. So the Shelby County case in 2013 essentially guts the uh, a substantial part of the Voting Rights Act. Um, the Supreme Court now has before it Section Two of the Voting Rights Act, um, which we used successfully. At, well, I'm the chairman of the National Democratic Redistricting Committee. We used Section Two to bring 
a case in Alabama this past year. Um, Alabama's got about 27% of the voting population. A lot of this stuff happens in Alabama. A lot of this stuff is Alabama. My, I married a woman from Alabama, and she so I understand what happens in Alabama. Now. She's explained <laughs> that to me. Um, we sued in Alabama. 27% of the voting population is, uh, is African American. Uh, and there are, about, there are seven congressmen in, from Alabama. And the lines are drawn in such a way that they deny uh, a substantial number of African Americans the ability to have what's called an opportunity zone. That African Americans probably ought to have, they just have one black congressman, they probably ought to be two. We sue under Section 2. A whole bunch of judges, including three Trump judges, said, you know, that's right. You need to redraw those lines in such a way that these black folks have the opportunity to um, elect, have the opportunity to elect a black congressman. Supreme Court reaches down and says, well, we're not going to rule on the merits, but this determination by this lower court is too close to the election, and therefore we're going to hold on to it, we'll decide this case, but you have to use these lines that this other court has said are unconstitutional for the vote that, uh, that just occurred. And so this case is now before uh, the United States um, Supreme Court. Now this decision by this lower court was made in January, the election would have been in November. The primaries would have been like in August or something like that. They had plenty of time uh, in which to do it. Wow. So tell me how many states now have uh, passed the voter restrictions since, um, the, I don't know, President Obama left office? Well, after the Shelby County case in 2013, again, not my name, the Shelby County case in 2013, um, states don't take years, they don't take months, they don't take weeks to put in place these voting restrictions. They put them in place within a matter of days. And it's not just in the South, although you see a lot of it happening in the South, also in Wisconsin, Ohio, uh, at the time, Michigan, uh, Virginia, a whole range of places put in place a, a number of um, restrictions. Since the Shelby County case in 2013, 1,700 polling places at last count have closed around um, the country. If the Voting Rights Act had not been um, affected by the Shelby County case, the Justice Department could have stopped that um, mm. from, from happening. And so, you know, 1,700 polling places doesn't sound like a lot, or it does sound like a lot to me. Uh, it is one of the reasons why you see in African-American communities such long lines, because there are fewer polling places. And also, again, so you think about what they did in Georgia. They passed this bill that says you can't give food or water to somebody who is waiting in line to vote. And you think, well, what's that all about? Well, if you close the polling places in places where there are large numbers of African Americans, you make the lines extremely long, you don't give people the ability to get food or water. So some people are going to say, look, I just can't, I just can't handle this. And again, one, two percent of the folks get out of line, that can have an impact on the election. And to give you just a statistic, in the last election in Atlanta in, um, in 2020, on the same night, this is after five o'clock, if you were in a white part of Atlanta voting, it took you on average six minutes to vote. In Atlanta, same election, same night, it took you 51 minutes to vote if you were African American. Wow. And so you can see, again, that notion of something that on its face seems kind of odd, but what's the purpose of it? It really has kind of a, you know, a really devious um, and intended impact. Right. Well, you described the crisis uh, about voting very well. And um, you, then you lay out a plan, and I'm going to get to that, and you talk a little bit about gerrymandering, too. But a member of the audience also sent this nice question that I, now this is not me, I'm not, okay. uh, it's, do you feel the depiction of you and how your work was a fair one in the Showtime series, Super Pump, the Battle for Uber? Okay. <laughs> All right, now Super Pumped is not really about the books. So I'll do this very quickly. Um, <laughs> As a lawyer, I had to do an investigation of Uber, and um, we found a whole bunch of things um, that the company was not doing correctly, uh, put in place a number of recommendations, leadership changed and all that, and the movie is about the work that we did um, at Uber. And so I'm in this, it's a Showtime series of, I don't know, six or seven episodes, uh, and no, the depiction was not right. Denzel Washington did not play me, okay? <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, what's that all about, right? Um, a guy named Hill Harper, who's actually a friend, um, actually played me, um, and he put, they put a mustache on him, and um, he actually does a pretty good job. I mean, I, I, I looked at it. I've not seen the whole series, but I looked at 
my kid sent me the clip where he he where he first appears, where I first appear, and he just kind of looked like me. I'm like, well, that's kind of kind of strange. And I did some other stuff to him, so he, he kind of looked like. But I'm still a little upset that it wasn't Denzel. <laughs> So he is a uh, Harper is a law school graduate. Yes, he is. Is good. Yeah. So so let's talk about your plan. You you say you want to make it easier right. to vote in America. What are some of the elements of your well, you plan? Well, you know what? Out of, out of concern that I would make, I want to make sure that everybody hears all the stuff that I had here. I brought my list. You know, I don't want to. All right. So what I try to do is look at you know the three branches of our government and try to figure out right, what is that we need to do with regard to each branch. If you look at the House of Representatives, the thing that we have to really do away with is gerrymandering. Um, gerrymandering um, allows one party to draw, <laughs> allows one party to draw the lines in such a way that you're almost guaranteed to have um, your party win in that district. Now, the negative impact of that is that people are not concerned about a general election. They're only concerned about a primary. That drives Republicans further and further to the right, and to be fair, it tends to can drive Democrats further and further to the left. It means that people don't want to um, you know, compromise. That's seen as a sign of weakness, and it invites a primary challenge because there's no cooperation, no desire to um, do things in a bipartisan way. Things don't get done. There's gridlock. People don't see government operating, and it breeds cynicism in the, in the country, in addition to the fact that in gerrymandered legislatures, you see um, legislators doing things that are inconsistent with the desires of their constituents, but they face no electoral consequence. You see, after the terrible decision where the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade, you now see being put in place these really draconian anti-choice laws. All the polling in every state has indicated that the voters did not want to have Roe versus Wade overturned. And yet, again, you see these very draconian anti-choice laws being put in place. Now, to be fair, the margins are different in New York than, say, in, in, in Texas. But these legislators can do things that, again, inconsistent with the desires of their voters, anti-choice, anti-reproductive um, opportuni choice opportunities for women, but know that they're not going to face any, um, they don't, in a general election, they're not going to face any issues, and they go to the right in this instance, and they're not going to face um, a primary challenge. So they can do things that are not supported by um, the people. So uh, very quickly, uh, the, the Senate, we need to end the filibuster. Um, that is something <laughs> the founding fathers were familiar with the Articles of Confederation, which is what we had before you know, the Constitution, and they rejected the notion of super majorities. They said that majority rule is the way we ought to do things. The filibuster is something that was invented. It's not of constitutional dimension. It is just something that is a, a Senate rule. We need to do away with that. We need to admit the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico uh, as, as states. The Supreme Court. We need to expand the Supreme Court. Um, there were two seats on the Supreme Court that essentially were, from my perspective, stolen. Um, Merrick Garland is, I think, doing a good job as Attorney General. He should be on the Supreme Court right now. He was not given the opportunity for a hearing because his nomination was supposedly too close to an election. Well, then we get to Amy Coney Barrett, and she is nominated and confirmed while people are in the process of voting. So those two seats, I think, need to be, um, we need to address the way in which they were um, selected. But I also think that the court should be expanded in such a way that it has in the past. There were, the number of justices has been consistent with the number of federal appellate courts that we have had. We now have 13 appellate courts, uh, 12 circuit courts, and one federal court, it's called the Fe Court of Federal Claims. Uh, 13 justices on the court, I think, would make a great deal of sense. So I think four additional justices. They should have 18-year terms. Um, they should not serve for life. In the presidency, we need to find a way to do away with or work around the Electoral College. Um, that is an anti-democratic thing. Now, that requires a constitutional amendment, hard to do, but there's a thing called the Voter um, Compact where the states will agree that they will cast their votes, not for who wins the election, who gets the greatest number of votes in their state, they'll cast their electoral votes for the people, for the person who gets the greatest number of votes around the country. If you get a sufficient number of states totaling 270 to, to agree to this, 
you essentially make the electoral college work be based on the national election as opposed to a state by state election. And I think that's what we need to do, because if you do that, um, Democrats would campaign in Texas, Republicans would be campaigning for the presidency in California, wouldn't be spending as much time in, in Iowa and these so-called you know, um, swing states, but in the places where the greatest number of people reside, you would have both parties competing. And then really quickly, just regard to voting, automatic voter registration, same day registration, make election day a national holiday. Um, end felon disenfranchisement, 14 days, for a guarantee of 14 days of early voting, cut down on polling uh, distances and times, again, increase the number of polling places that we have, um, make sure that people have the ability to cast a ballot by mail. We tried that in 2020, people like that. Um, free voter, voter ID, to the extent that you're gonna have that, and the American people tend to support the notion of um, voter ID, and I, I'm, 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 I support the notion of voter ID as opposed to photo ID. You ought to prove who you claim to be if you're going to cast a ballot, but you ought to be able to do that in a number of ways. If you have you know, rent receipts, a whole bunch of things that you can prove, well, I'm actually Eric Holder, I should be able to vote. And so I think that, that's fine. Um, so that, this is kind of what, this is in section three of the, uh, of the book. First part is about the history, the second part is about kind of where we are now, and the third part deals with all of these proposals about uh, how we can um, reinvigorate our democracy and save, save it. You, you only missed one. Okay, what's that? Pre-registering 16 and 17. Exactly, exactly. I mean, you know, it's interesting. In North Carolina, um, that used to be some, and it was done in other, other states as well, you pre-register 16 and 17-year-olds so that when they turn 18, they'll have the ability um, to vote. Uh, North Carolina Republicans come into power and they, again, this is one of these things, you, you take it away and you figure, well, well you know, what's that all about? Um, why would you stop that? Well, all the numbers, the statistics show that young people tend to vote for Democrats. And so Republicans, when they come into power in North Carolina, they, um, they stop that. One of the biggest impediments to people voting is registering. Um, our registration systems around the country are unnecessarily difficult. So uh, one of the proposals that I have is that, you know, whenever you come in contact with the government, you should be given the opportunity to register to vote. If you are renewing your driver's license, if you are doing, you're paying your water bill, if you're coming in contact with the government in any way, have an ability for people to fill out the necessary forms, and which don't need to be very particularly complicated, um, and have people have the ability to uh, to register to vote. It's, uh, it flows right into a question that was asked. Uh, as we continue to fight for equality, what would you say or what advice would you give to our young activists, young people out there? That they ought to be optimistic, you know? Um, that what this book shows is that every generation has faced questions about saving our democracy, making our democracy more perfect. And the barriers that they faced seemed insurmountable. Um, and yet, Alice Paul, you know, was determined. And people who worked with her, Ida Bay Wells, um, you know, did all the things that, they, that were necessary to guarantee that women had the right to vote. Um, people gave their lives so that uh, African Americans would have the right to vote. You know, I'm sure that Dr. King, John Lewis, um, you know, Hosea Williams at some point probably thought to themselves, Diane Nash thought to themselves, can we really take down a system of American apartheid? I mean, you know, can we really do this? And yet they fought for an America that had never existed, uh, an America that they could only imagine. And I think that's what I would tell young activists. Um, look at the, the barriers that you face and imagine that America that you want to be and understand that previous generations of Americans um, faced, you know, maybe even greater barriers than the ones that you face now, and they were successful. This cannot be, and I take, I'm not saying just young people now, we cannot be the first generation that does not protect our democracy. Uh, we have, every, every generation has met the challenge, whether it was civil war, whether it was fascism, you know, across, we sent the pride of our nation, um, you know, to Europe to fight for democracy. We sent people, whatever you want to say about the Iraq war, you know, that was supposedly to allow people there the right uh, to determine their own fate. 
um, we have always answered the call. This generation can't be the first one um, that fails to do so. So it's going to mean commitment, hard work, um, and sacrifice. But we can do it. We can do it. You have some critics. I have a few critics. Yes. More than a few, actually. One, one of the critics that uh, we hear on a station that shall not be named uh, says, why, why is the general holder getting all upset with uh, these restrictions? Look at the turnout in Georgia, twice for Raphael Warnock. Um, if things, if the restrictions are so bad, why, uh, how do you explain uh, that great turnout? Two reasons why the turnout was greater. First off, the population has increased, all right? Duh. Um, <laughs> and, and second, people said, all right, you're going to make it more difficult for us to vote. We have to have ID. We have to wait in line. We've got to do a whole variety of things. And you know what people said? Good. We got that. We got that. We'll do that. Right. And so all the things that they tried to do to depress turnout were overcome by the will of people, and particularly people of color, to say, you know what? Our ancestors died so that I would have the right to vote. And if it means I gotta wait in line, if it means I gotta wait in the, the sun, the hot sun, or in the pouring rain, um, without food, without water, um, I'm going to do so. So that increase in population, coupled with the determination of people to vote, is what really has um, kept those numbers at where they should be. And the other thing is, you know, it's almost a thought experiment. If those restrictions were not in place, my suspicion is the numbers would be even higher. Ah, right. Even higher. <laughs> yeah. What do you think, though, um, in your plan, given all the things that you talked about in the plan, you now have got a divided Congress. Um, do you see uh, possibilities of, of uh, actually getting the, uh, these things implemented? No, I don't think so. I mean, just to be you know, honest about it, I don't, I don't really think so. Um, I think that what we have to do is focus our attention on winning elections, and especially at the state level. You know, we have yeah. to, uh, we tend to, progressives, Democrats tend to get, tend to get all excited about who's running for president. And, you know, we episodically get involved in um, the electoral process. And what we need to be thinking about is who runs, who's running not only for governor, but our state legislature, who's running for mayor, yeah. who's running in our city council. Definitely focus on mayor. There we go. There we go. You know? And when you get a good one, don't let him get away. Um, <laughs> That's right. And so we need to be focused on those things. I think the reality is that with this House of Representatives and with the, the makeup of that House, and you see how they conducted themselves last yeah. night in the State of the Union, um, I think all we can hope from them is that they won't crash through the debt ceiling and that they'll pass budgets for the executive branch agencies. The, yeah. the likelihood of getting um, these proposals through um, that House of Representatives, I think, is pretty small. Another question came in. Do you think that protests would work, protest marches, would, and would they be effective um, to you know, help address some of these plans? That was one of the questions uh, yeah. asked. Oh, oh, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, we, we, again, we can't think that uh, this is only about, when I talk about the House of Representatives, that means we're talking about federal um, laws. But the reality is most of voting is concerned at the state level. And so protests matter a great deal. Um, what you see is that a, a lot of what they try to do with regard to gerrymandering or putting in place these voter restrictions, they try to do it out of sight of, of, of the people. And to the extent that the people are engaged in the process or are protesting uh, against that which is done, that has an impact on um, what certain uh, people in the legislature w will do. North Carolina, we won a case and we asked the Supreme Court in North Carolina, and said, all right, the lines have to be redrawn. We said, we like, how about this? We'd like to have the legislature, as they're drawing the lines, this stuff should be televised, and it should be on the internet. So you can look at it, and so people can see when the lines are being drawn, they'll have the ability to see what is actually going on. Um, people got engaged in the process, and then we trained people so that they would know if a line was drawn here, that would, meant, would be unfavorable for this group here, uh, it would favor another yeah. group. And the ability of people to actually see what's going on and the ability of people to then, if they didn't like what was going on, to protest in front of some state legislators 
um, office or something like that. We saw actually move people in the state legislature yeah. in, uh, in North Carolina. So I think protest is still something that um, has to be a part of our arsenal in, in our fight for, uh, right. for democracy. And, and I think we need to be you know, optimistic. Pessimism, I think, tends to breed um, inaction. Um, optimism, I think, breeds involvement. Yeah. That's what we need, involvement. Con connect for us, uh, again, your friends at the Supreme Court. Um, and I've got a lot of critics in the Supreme Court. Yeah. yeah. How, what's the connection between um, what they did in the um, Citizens United case and your efforts to try to make ours a better democracy? Yeah, I mean, this court, the Roberts court, through a series of rulings has, that, that I call anti-democracy rulings, has made it easier for special interests to be involved in our electoral system, Citizens United, you know, everybody, all kinds of entities now can con contribute money um, in a way that, uh, without having to, you know, reveal who, who they are. The Shelby County case really kind of goes after, um, you know, the Voting Rights Act, the Rucho decision, Supreme Court says, all right, you can't bring gerrymandering cases um, in, in, in federal court. Uh, th there's a whole range of things that this court has done um, to make it more difficult to vote or, or made, um, gave the ability to the states to make it more difficult for, uh, for people to vote. Uh, I actually think that this is going to be part of the legacy of the Roberts Court. And 50 years from now, 100 years from now, people will look back at this era and call it an anti-democracy um, Supreme Court. Wow. This is, um, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Didn't know whether they were applauding for the court or against the court. <laughs> the, um, another kind of interesting question, because your role as attorney general involved not only the voting rights, but generally the protection of all of us, keeping us safe. And last night in the State of the Union address, there was a president alluded to um, excuse me. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Tyree Nichols. No, uh, yeah, the Tyree Nichols, uh, but about giving the talk. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And one of our uh, questioners asked, how did you give the talk uh, to your family? Yeah, you know, it's an interesting thing. It's, uh, it's a tradition in African-American households. Um, my father had the talk with me, which is to <clears throat> tell, tell me, um, you know, his son, if you're ever stopped by police, um, this is how you um, interact with them, you know? Um, whether you're being treated fairly or unfairly, you don't raise your voice, um, you are respectful, uh, you will we'll work it out later. You, you survive that interaction and you come home to me and then we will deal with that. I thought, I hoped that that would be a tradition that would end with my father um, sharing that with me. And the reality is that I have had the talk with my son. Um, he is a, he worked for, um, you know, your new governor. He uh, was in, involved in his campaign. He's now working for the governor. He's spending a lot of time in Annapolis. Um, and he is, you know, I'm 6'2". He's about 6'5". He's big. And he's the nicest, sweetest kid in the history of the world. Now, his sisters are rough, okay? But he's, he's, a, he's a sweet kid. And I tell him, you know, you got to understand something. His name is Eric, but we call him Buddy. I said, Buddy, you got to understand, a, a police officer, you know, a bad one, will potentially see you in a way that is inconsistent with who you are. Mm -hmm. And so here's what you have to do. And the same things that my father told me, I have shared um, with him. And there is still, you know, there's still that feeling I have in me. He'll say to me, you know, when he calls home, um, you know, I'm going out tonight. And I, I hear that. I'm going out with my friends. His best friend is a guy named Conrad and, and, and Ian. You know, I'm going out with them. And I always think to myself, you know, I say, oh, well, you know, you know, just, uh, you know, just send me a text. Call me when you get home. Dad, I'm, I'm 23 years old. What do I got to do that for? Well, you know, just, just. But the reality is I'm worried about it. You know, I'm worried about it. Now, you know, it is, it's something that's frustrating to have had that talk, but it's also frustrating to deal with something that the president said last night, 
that um, those police officers who engage in these activities are not held accountable. And that is frustrating to me because my brother is a retired police officer. And the vast majority of police officers do a great job. But those who don't and who are not held accountable um, give those others a bad name and erode the trust that has to exist between people in law enforcement and the communities that, um, that they serve. So the talk is still something that is unfortunately a, a tradition that we have to um, pass on to our sons. My hope is that um, my son, uh, imagining my son as a father, is, I have to wrap my mind around that. <laughs> but if he becomes a father and if he has a son, um, my hope is that he will not have to have that conversation with his boy in the way that my father had to have with his son. The, there was another question here about whether we... Uh, still have a kind of a double standard of justice. And I was thinking about it in terms of uh, when I watched last night, uh, if George Santos was black. <laughs> yeah, well, I think you know, I, I think here's a reality. I think if George Santos were black, he wouldn't have been elected. <laughs> I mean, that the opposition research that you would normally do on any candidate, and you know what this is about having been in electoral politics, would certainly have been done to a greater degree than was done with George Santos, um, the Jewish guy that he is, or <laughs> Brazilian guy that he is, or whatever it is he is. That, that research would have been done were he black, and he would have been found out before the election. Now, so I don't think he would have been elected. And my guess is, well, I don't know, a black Republican like this, well, I, 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 that, that's, that's just, that, that just kind of just boggles the mind. But, you know, that double standard shows up in other ways. We did a, a study um, when I announced this uh, this Smart on Crime initiative when I was Attorney General, and we looked at people in the federal criminal justice system, which we think is the best one in the country. Um, and we looked at pe black defendants, white defendants charged with the same crime, same criminal history, and found out that black defendants got sentences that were 20% higher than their white counterparts, controlling for everything else, 20% higher, uh, which shows that you know, even with federal sentencing guidelines, there were still, you know, there's still discretion that judges have, that implicit bias that we all carry with us um, is still a part of our system and results in these dualities that um, shouldn't be a part of America in the 21st century. Well, you're expressing a great deal of optimism here tonight. So let me ask you to look out for uh, five years from now. How, how would you like to see the system, uh, particularly as it relates to voting and our democracy, what fundamental change would you hope to have achieved in the next, over the next five years? You know, I think that let's, so 2024 is going to be extremely important. Um, I think, you know, a Democrat has to win the presidency. I guess that'll be uh, President Biden running again. Democrats have to hold the Senate. It's going to be difficult, um, but not impossible. Uh, and Democrats have to um, win the, um, the House of Representatives. If you do that and recreate that which we had uh, up until this last election in, in 2022, um, federal legislation could do so much. We could do so much there. Um, you could pass what did not pass before, the John Lewis Voting Rights uh, Protection Act, which would prohibit gerrymandering, um, guarantee uh, you know, early voting, do a whole range of things, mail voting. There's a whole range of things that the federal government um, can do. So that's my hope. 2024, Democrats do well. And that Democrats then use that power in ways that we did not um, in this past term. Um, you know, Senators Cinema and Manchin did not allow for the removal of the, um, of the filibuster. Had they done that, all of these things could have been put in place um, then. Now, Senator Cinema says that she is um, going to run as an independent. I hope she's defeated, and I hope that a Democrat will take her place. Um, and we now have, after the election in 2022, Democrats have now 51 votes. So um, if we can get a new Democrat to replace Senator Sinema, hold all the seats that we have, 
we would then have, and it's, Senator Manchin still doesn't want to do it, we would have 50 Democratic senators who would be able to uh, remove the, the filibuster. So the 2024 election um, is going to be a really critical one in terms of our democracy and a whole range of other things, but especially with regard to our democracy and the right to vote. The um, number of people have uh, said, whispered that they thought you ought to be a candidate for uh, uh, elective office. Would you uh, consider uh, that? Well, that's, that's an interesting question. And as I was kidding around with you and you pointed to your wife, um, <laughs> when I was, I, was the US, I was the United States attorney in Washington, DC, and there was some talk maybe I'd run for mayor of Washington, DC. And I said, all right, that, that's, I might consider that. And what my lovely wife, again, from Mobile, Alabama, her sister was the young woman who integrated the University of Alabama in 1963, Vivian Malone, George Wallace, that was her sister. Um, what the lovely Sharon said to me was, look, you would make a great mayor uh, and I would vote for you, but you'd be running as a single man. <laughs> So in, 2020, uh, <laughs> in 2020, I toyed with the idea of running for president and we did some polling and it was, it was pretty interesting. Uh, and I said, hey, Sharon, you know, and she said, remember, mayor? Remember that? <laughs> now, she has since that time said, hey, well, if you had actually decided to do it, you know, you know, I would have gotten yeah. in line. But I, no, I, I was looking for the footnote there that said, happy wife, happy life. There we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I do see that you've dedicated uh, some to uh, to your sister-in-law. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and plus, you know, I'm only I'm only 72, so uh, I'm I'm still too young. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, I, ask me in eight years. Ask me in eight years. That's right. Okay. Well, General, I uh, I on behalf of all of us. Well, can here, I just say one more? Yeah, thing? yeah, please. Okay. Uh, your show. First of all, I want to again thank you all for for coming out. Uh, I hope you'll enjoy the book. We did it in a way, it's an accessible book. The first couple of chapters I wrote, uh, I shared with my co-author, and he said, man, these read like a law review article. This is going to put people to sleep. So what we tried to do was tell stories and make it, history very interesting and engaging. Uh, it's an accessible book, and I think you, you'll, you'll enjoy it that way. Um, but but I, as I said to the mayor, to the president, um, we need to be optimistic. But we need to understand that positive change, as I said, is not promised. We have to be prepared to fight for the change in the way that the people in this book did. You know, Dr. King said that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. But here's the deal. It doesn't bend on its own. It only bends when people like us, people like you, put their hands on that arc and pull it towards justice. And so... What, what you've got to ask yourself is what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing to bend that art? What are you doing to put your hand on that art and pull it towards justice? It's not enough to look at MSNBC, CNN, watch Fox and throw things at the television. That's, you know, that's not enough. What is it that you are doing? There's a whole range of activities that you can be engaged in, like my son got involved in the, uh, the, the gubernatorial campaign, and now he is doing advance for your new governor, you know? Um, a whole range of things. But you don't have to get involved only in electoral things to help this nation get better. There are children in this country who are starved for the kind of attention that every American child is entitled to. Work in a youth program. Come up with some way that you make your community better. Now, it won't be easy, because you've got busy business lives, personal lives, but if you can find an hour or two a week to be engaged in this activity, you're gonna feel better about yourself, this community is gonna be better, and this nation is going to be better as a result. Um, we can do this. We can do this if we will find our way to, to get ourselves involved like past generations have, have done so. We can't be the first generation to fail this nation. Let's get it done. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.